Thank you. So my name is Shabir. Um, I work at Emirates MBD as a lead agile coach. Uh, my background is all in agile and delivery for the last 15 odd years. Uh, prior to that, I was in software development, so I have a bit of a technical background as well. And I've been in Dubai for uh, around three years now. Uh, Emirates MBD has been just over a year, and prior to that, I was with Shalou Group, which is uh, one of the retail groups over here that look after a lot of the luxury fashion brands in, in the region. So yeah, that's me. All right, thank you, everyone. Um, sorry for starting a bit late, but I have to say a massive thank you, of course, to Zia, Mohammed, and the organizing team at Agility Evolution for bringing us all together. I think it's a great initiative that we're having these uh, events in the UAE. It's something that I felt was missing for quite some time, so really appreciative. So thank you so much to Zia and Mohammed for putting this event together so that people like us can come together, we can talk about Agile and other related topics and kind of share our, our experiences, network, get to know each other, and hopefully this will continue uh, for a long time to come. All right, I'm going to get started. Uh, I do want to make this quite discussion-based as well, so I'm going to be talking about things, very keen to hear your thoughts as well, and maybe we can try to come to a shared understanding as we go through this uh, kind of talk I've prepared. I'm quite light on the slides, so I'm going to do talking, but I want some interaction from yourselves as well. So hopefully we can kind of have some good discussion and come to some sort of shared understanding by the end of the session. That's kind of what I'm looking to get out of it. So just to get started, you guys may have seen this text. Um, I kind of hope you have because this is the description of the event. So if you haven't seen it, I don't know why you're here because <laughs> that, that means, I don't know, something else must have attracted you to this attend, uh, uh, event. But let's just go over this, right? Because uh, I put some words together and actually there was some meaning behind it that I really want to focus on in this session because of, uh, there's some things that have been bothering me with what I've been seeing with agile transformations, uh, not just recently, but actually over many years now. And it's a common pattern. And that's actually what I want to talk about today. So there's a few things I've actually highlighted here, right? And these, this is going to be a bit of a continuing thread through our discussion today. So. I'm just going to read this out and then I'm going to kind of um, add some comments along the way. So many organizations aim to become agile. And I'm sure a lot of you have actually seen this when you've worked in organizations. Either you've been part of a transformation or you have kind of observed one from some distance. And there's always a goal from top down, right? We need to be agile. Okay. And, and that's usually it. That's the goal. Just be agile. So either through transformational programs or organic growth. So sometimes it can happen naturally. If it does, I always feel that's the best way of doing it. Or like I said, there might be some direction from top down that we're going to do a transformation. The way we've been working for X amount of time before is no longer working for us. We need to adapt to changes quicker. We need to therefore do an agile transformation. And a lot of the time you refer to a scaled framework like SAFE. How many of you are familiar with SAFE? I think this is a pretty common framework. So everyone, perfect. So yeah, safe, scaled, agile framework, um, that's often seen as the end goal. That's the goal that we want to get to an organization to. Um, the growth is assumed to be to necessitate a scaled, agile framework. So when we're growing as an organization, we suddenly feel there is a need for us to have a scaled, agile framework. That's like the answer to the problem of growth. Let's put a scaled framework in. We're growing, therefore we need to find a way of working with this growth. Let's put a scaled framework in. And it kind of, it makes sense as well. The ultimate state, like I said, is often perceived as being capable of executing program increment planning every quarter and enhancing that plan's stability. So how many of you, I know some of you anyway, are working in a safe-ish organization? Okay, so not too many, kind of there. Mohammed's not sure, fair enough. Um, some of you who have worked there um, may have seen that quite often we get into a cadence, right? We're going to be doing what's known as PI planning, program increment planning, every quarter. And what ends up happening is our goal is always to try and lock that plan down every quarter. That's it. Like All our goal is all about is actually how can we make that plan more and more, more rigid? How can we lock down that plan so we have absolute certainty that that is what we're going to be delivering? So our role ends up changing from the transformational aspect to locking down the plan on a quarterly basis. So actually, we're, we're probably not doing the things that we should be doing. So I argue that this shouldn't be seen as a final state. And actually, PI planning, SAFE, and all of this type of stuff should only be seen as a transitional phase in order to get you to somewhere better, to get you to a higher level of agility. Now, to start with, that kind of begs the question of, well, what is business agility in the first place? 
And I kind of wanted to open up the floor a little bit here. What do you guys think business agility is? And I don't think, personally, I don't, I personally don't feel comfortable saying that there is one single definitive uh, definition of this, but I'm very keen to hear your thoughts. So what, what does everyone think business agility is? How would you define it maybe? Yeah, potentially, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, exactly. Get some feedback quickly from multiple places. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, adapting, yeah. Quick, quick adaption. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Yes, Rogan. Yeah, yeah, potentially increase somehow, get something out a bit quicker. Yeah, potentially, yeah. And self critical, so that inspect and adapt piece. Yeah, yeah. Any other thoughts? Okay, so I actually, when I actually sat down and I thought I'm going to write a definition, I actually really struggled writing a single definition that I was really happy with. I Googled, I searched around, and I, I just wasn't happy with it. So I asked my good friend, Copilot. And this is kind of what it gave me. I did a little bit of paraphrasing as well. So agility in an organization is the ability to be flexible and adaptable so that it can respond quickly and effectively to change. And I think a few key words that stand out to me here is, of course, quickly, but also effectively as well. There's no point for us to respond quickly to something, but actually we make a right hash of it and we're delivering poor quality products to the market and our customers are ultimately going to actually be very upset with us and have a poor experience. So I felt starting with this was quite important because I want to set the scene, right? This is what agility actually means to us. Nowhere over here are we saying for us to be agile, we have to use a scale framework. For us to be agile, we have to make sure our PI planning is really robust. Yes, those are tools, but that's not the end goal, right? This is, we have to keep in mind, this is what agility is actually about. So I was doing a bit of research and reading and I've, provided the sources to all of these things, but I've came across some really interesting stuff. This is actually the rate of change of technology uh, over the last um, uh, 20 odd years, sorry, from 1800 to 2020. And what you can see is, you know, we started with things like iron and water power and stuff, and now we're getting into renewable energies, nanotechnology and AI. If you look at each wave, and I think Zia, you probably would have, you know, read into this a lot more than even I have. Each wave of kind of uh, improvement or each wave where we're really seeing a drastic uh, revolution of technology is getting smaller and smaller, which means the rate of change is quicker now than ever. The amount of change that is happening with technology, the amount of change that is even happening in the world, even if you look at the geopolitical climate of today versus maybe even 20 years ago, the amount of stuff just happening in today's day and age is way, way more than what was happening even, let's say, 20 years ago. And therefore, it's not, you know, not absurd to say, okay, due to this rate of change, we need to have frameworks and methodologies in place to cater for that. So there is this increase in market and industry complexity, and that rapid rate of change necessitates flexible frameworks, right? And we've actually seen that. So this is taken from, uh, if anyone knows of Smartsheet, it's actually more of a project management tool but they actually have a few things where they try to plug in agile related stuff into it as well. But they've got this quite nice handy uh, little uh, time chart where they actually show the different frameworks and when they've kind of dropped. And what you can actually see over here is kind of in the, you know, um, pr uh, pre prior to kind of 2000s, there were only a few frameworks. Then as you kind of go along, in the last 10 to 15 years, we've seen a massive increase in the amount of frameworks that are now available to us today. Right, so our focus is now always turning to what framework do we have to use? What tools are out there for us to actually use? It's now drifting away from the agility piece and now always going towards this kind of what framework do we need to use? Uh, what, what, what are the kind of ways that we can increase our robustness and reliability of things like PI planning? So I actually went and again, doing some research, I wanted to get some stats out. Does anyone know what this stat might be about? Just put some random numbers on the screen. Hope that people can guess. Any idea? Nope, nope. Yeah, exactly. So this is actually uh, worldwide 
um, according to this incredible tools, uh, Agile statistics as of July 2023, so last year, 71% of IT organizations have adopted Agile, right? So that really means, you know, we should be in a much better place. You know, everyone's, so many organizations are working in an Agile way. That's great. They must be responding to change. They must be delivering iterative versions of their product quickly to the users. They must be listening to that feedback. And just interestingly, because I was really wondering about SAFE, um, interestingly, SAFE themselves do not publish statistics. I don't know if you know about this here, but they don't publish statistics on adoption of SAFE, what organizations are using it. They're very closed about that information. I managed to get from one paper that 33% of YT organizations have adopted SAFE. For me, that seems like a bit of an imbalance. We're saying that there's a need for these scaled frameworks and SAFE obviously positions itself as being the leading scaled agile framework available on the market, yet only a third of organizations are adopting it. That really kind of struck a nerve with me. I was thinking, well, why is that the case? What's going on here? Yes. This is global. Agreed. Yeah, this is not region specific. This is all global data. So yeah, this is not region specific. I was just looking at this holistically. Uh, I think if we go region specific, I think the conversation will be very different. Each region has its own particular challenges. Yes. Yeah. So there's a paper written actually. So it's on a website called Springer Link. It's actually an academic paper that was written on the benefits and challenges of adopting SAFE. It was written back in 2021, but this is literally the only data I can find on adoption of SAFE. Yes. Yeah. 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 That would be great. Yeah, please, if you can find, that would be great. If I would love, just for out of my own curiosity, I would love to know if there's some official published data. Sorry. So they're very far along the way yeah 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 sure don't get me wrong i'm not bashing safe right yeah <laughs> now i want to be clear i think there's good good and bad things actually in in all frameworks available out there so i'm not bashing a methodology i'm actually just trying to get us thinking of agility in a bit of a different way rather than focusing on a framework right so like i said we're seeing so many organizations using Agile methodologies. We're seeing a lesser number, maybe, are going to be using scaled framework, that being the leading uh, scaled Agile framework available on the market. And it just got me thinking, actually, so what's really going on with Agile in the market? So, again, uh, there's actually on Scrum Inc., which is quite a famous uh, Scrum blog, they posted this. So they wrote the Standish Group data shows consistently over the last 20 years for over half a million projects. 64% of features delivered to customers are never ready or rarely used. So that was actually really eye-opening to me because when we talk about agility, we're always talking about getting close to the customer, finding out what the customer wants, getting feedback, you know, making sure that we're prioritizing effectively and we're delivering the value to the customer. Yet we've got a piece of statistic here saying that for half a million IT projects, 64% of the features were never used or customer, uh, by customers or they were rarely used by customers. Furthermore, what this paper and what this uh, article actually said is without a good product owner organization of the 70 projects that might be useful, we waste 64% of our staff working on things that customers will not use. So I don't have uh, a dollar uh, equation to that. I don't have the actual cost amount of that because it can be uh, different in region and organizations. But to think that up to two thirds of your staff working on IT projects are essentially wasting their time is really eye opening. Right? Something is not right there. Yeah. There you go. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So this is from 2020. So the percentage may be more up to date, uh, but this was again globally. This they collected data from a number of different places. But again, this was very, very eye-opening to me that how come that 
we say we're working agile, 71% of IT organizations have adopted agile ways of working. A third of IT organizations are using scale frameworks to necessitate for that kind of large complex piece that we're saying the market is, is in. Yet we're wasting two thirds of our staff and out of half a million projects, again, two thirds of features are basically rarely or never used by our customers. Something's not right. Now, more so, then I started looking at the bigger picture. Okay, what about agile transformations? Over the past two decades since, agile, since the Agile Manifesto came into place, again, it's a very wide range, but 50 to 96% of agile transformation processes have failed due to the inability to rapidly adapt to market and envir environmental changes in a productive and cost-efficient manner. Again, that's a very damning statistic uh, if we were looking at things from an agile way. This is starting to paint the picture that is agile really the right thing for us in the current state or are we just doing things the wrong way right it really begs the question what's going on they're seeing these types of statistics out there something is not right so market is changing more rapidly than ever technology is more complex than ever especially these days you know there's various ai related things available for us we have more agile frameworks available than ever that should be helping us and we're carrying out, you know, PI planning again and again and hoping that, we, you know, now, now is going to be that quarter where we deliver that killer feature. But yet there is a high rate of failure in delivering value to our customer like we saw. So clearly this is not our end state. Using frameworks like SAFE, using um, other agile methodologies out there and finishing our so-called transformation there is not the end state that we should all be working towards. Clearly, there's something else. And actually, that's what I kind of want to dive into just a little bit here. So I kind of thought of uh, three main areas that I felt were really, really important for us uh, to focus on. So agile frameworks are just tools. And I think that's the first thing that we have to remember. I think a lot of us, uh, including myself, we get caught up in, right, I need to help make a team agile. or I need to help make this domain agile. And what that means is, I'll get them working in two week sprints. I'll get them you know, uh, doing a PI planning. I'll get them doing scrum of scrums. I'll make sure that the burn down charts look all amazing and everything like that. And that's it. But actually that shouldn't be it. I think we're forgetting that's not where the focus should be. Actually our focus should instead be on a few different things. One is the funnel. Can anyone guess why I put the, the, the poop emoji here? Sorry? Crap in, crap out, right? So this is, um, uh, I actually even put a source for this. So if anyone's got, I'm, I'm going to explain. This is actually a really interesting article if anyone wants to know about the origin of the emoji itself. Um, very, very fun read if anyone is into it. So we'll find a way of sharing all this stuff afterwards with the group on Meetup and stuff. But very fun article. I made sure I did my research properly. I didn't want to put anything without sources, right? So. But my main point is, right, crap in, crap out. I think the first thing we need to do is really build our product management capability, right? Agile transformations do not start and end with just development teams working in two, two week sprints and doing quarterly cadences and stuff like that. Without product management capability working efficiently, everything else will be a failure, right? And we saw that in one of the early statistics where it said without product organization, two thirds of your staff are essentially being wasted upon. You know, they're wasting their efforts working on features that customers are never going to use. So what we really need to find a way of focusing and shifting our focus towards is empowerment and autonomy to our product owners. You know, making sure that they are actually empowered to be a product owner. And I hope everyone knows what I mean by that, because I'm sure a lot of you have worked with product owners who do not actually own their product. They have no say over what is actually happening with their product. They cannot influence the direction of which their product is going to go in. They actually don't even know how their product is performing, right? And actually, they're supposed to be a product owner, right? So I think us as agile individuals, we have to actually help coach them and bring them up to that level where they understand what is their role and responsibility, and they understand that they actually carry very, very hefty responsibility as owning a product. They have to be able to do effective prioritization. And I'll talk about that in just a second. And they actually have to say no to this top-down product management. Um, um, top-down driven product management um, way of working where just because some person who's higher ranked than you says we must do this feature then that's it right there has to be some logical reasoning there has to be some why 
to what we're doing. It can't just be that person A said we're doing this and that's what we're doing. Where is the value in that? There must be a bit of an understanding, a bit of a thought process put behind that. Number two, and this is one that really um, frustrates me quite a lot, actually, is we everyone knows about lean thinking. I think everyone, most of you guys have probably heard of it. Um, but what I actually wrote was end-to-end -end lean thinking. Because what I have often observed and seen is we might work, let's say, with a product owner uh, or you know a, a select group of business users. We might really you know, slice our product down in really nice, lean manner. We've got an MVP, very nicely defined, etc. And then all of a sudden, we'll come to, let's say, the actual building uh, time of it. But on our, our architect is saying we need to design a monolithic application, which is going to take six months to build, and we need this and that and whatnot, right? Why were they not involved right at the beginning? I think that's something that we are, again, missing out on. Again, as agile people, we have to make sure that everyone is on that journey together right from the beginning and that they are thinking of the product in the same way. The only way we can do that is including them right from the beginning, making sure our technical folk and our business folk are in it together. And whenever we're doing any kind of you know, product definition type stuff, when we're slicing down things in MVPs and whatnot, that's done as a um, co-led uh, uh, event. So just a few points on this. So yeah, no point planning a product in a lean way and then suddenly our architects are designing a mammoth monolithic solution, right? Then you've lost your value of trying to you know, work in a lean manner. Let's get all parties involved in this end-to-end. -end. And I think like kickoffs is probably one of the uh, easiest places or quick wins that we can have that you can make sure that people are involved right from the beginning. You know, having a nice kickoff session, making it very effective by making sure that you're talking about the product, bringing what the business value is, you know, bringing some technical thought to that as well. That can really change whether that product is a success or a failure. And the last one, actually, from my side is ruthless prioritization, right? Something which I feel a lot of organizations globally struggle on is actually prioritizing things effectively. Everything cannot be a P1, right? How many of us have probably worked in places where we've been given, you know, definitely more than one thing and it's, everything's a P1, right? Every, all of you guys have experienced it, or majority of yourselves. It's not feasible, right? It doesn't work that way. So I think we have to really coach, again, our product management capability and all of us as a team on how to actually effectively prioritize. And again, I'll share these links, but this is a really, really good article that I've linked to over here where the author actually goes into how a single team can come up with a prioritization mechanism that works for that team as well. So it's not just an individual product owner or an individual person who's doing a prioritization. It's a team-based activity. And I think that's a really smart way of looking at it because a product owner may prioritize something, but that might not be feasible from a technical perspective. It needs to be a joint activity between the two. All right. And just to finish up, actually, there, there was um, a really good uh, diagram that I came across, which really sums up a lot of the points that I've said. I think the, the color hopefully uh, still makes it readable. But this was from Net Solutions on the same article that I referred to earlier where they were talking about why agile transformations fail. And they actually really nicely summarized the key points that they found during their studies of why agile transformations fail. And very interestingly, you can probably do a bit of a grouping on this. And what you can actually see is on the left-hand side, you've got things like lack of agile understanding. You've got things like not investing in hiring the right people. Uh, you've got things like project-oriented instead of product-oriented, product right? You've got a lot of things which you can you, you need to change mindsets around. And then you've got obviously other things around, you know, restricting Agile to pilots, for example. I think sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, I'm on the fence about that one. But you've got a lot of other things, you know, which, you know, you need to kind of really uh, work with some key stakeholders in organizations like lack of management support and so on. Um, but this, I really recommend everyone to kind of go away. Again, we'll find a way of sharing these links. But this uh, article is quite a lengthy one. They actually give a description of all of these points. They've actually documented quite a lot of stuff into what you could potentially try and do to counter each of these points. But it was very insightful for me when I was looking at this that a lot of these are probably things that a lot of people actually have faced and still to this day are facing, yet we're, we're not finding solutions to them. Okay. I'm actually going to end on that. 
uh, that's actually where I wanted to finish. So thank you very much for listening. I actually wanted to open up the floor. I've said quite a lot, and I wanted to actually just have a bit of discussion rather than me talk on for a lot longer.